Well, hello. My name is Angel Wood, and this is Crime of the Truest Kind. Hey everybody, welcome back. I recorded a bit and my dogs just would not stop barking. I can often overlook some of it, and I often do, because when I sit down here in my studio and I work, they're almost always with me. I don't sit in like an isolation booth and all of that nonsense. I find that to be pretty unnecessary. However, they do make a lot of noise. So take two. For those of you who follow on the social platforms, you may know that I am in the middle of a nine-night music festival that I plan here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I live. It is called the Rock and Roll Rumble. For locals, it is the Rock and Roll Rumble, the same Rock and Roll Rumble that originated on 1041 WBC and the Rock of Boston back in the late 70s. Predates me by many, many years, but we're doing it. This is episode 62. Earlier this week, I dropped a replay of the episode going back to May 2021. What is it? Episode 17. It is about a girl named Beth Brody. She was from a small town in northern Massachusetts, where I grew up. The first many years of my life were spent in the town of Groveland, Massachusetts. It's very small. I'm reviewing the script from the 2021 episode about Beth, and the population of Groveland, Massachusetts is about 6,400 people. Still no grocery store in sight. Jerry's Variety is still there in Elm Park. I recommend that you go and listen to episode 17. Beth Brody, Crime of a Hometown Kind, Groveland, Massachusetts, with Beth's brother, Sean Aylward, from May 5th, 2021. We are revisiting Beth's case this week because Beth's murderer is seeking parole. When Beth was murdered in November of 1992, Beth was barely 15 and didn't ever get the chance to even realize the person that she would become. And we do talk about that a bit in episode 17, and we'll talk about that now in episode 62. For a refresher on Beth's case, and yes, I will mention the name of the person who murdered her, for a couple of reasons. One, that person is seeking to be paroled. Two, his name is mentioned in the subsequent interview with Beth's brother, Sean. Beth Brody had just turned 15. She had a brand new set of braces when she was murdered in the fall of 1992. She was 15. Remember being 15? I knew nothing. I knew nothing about the world. I knew I wanted to, but I hadn't really had the chance yet. I know Groveland, Massachusetts. It is a small town, as I have said time and time again when talking about it. I love Groveland. When I go, I drive through my old neighborhood, and I drive around, and I look at places that bring back the good memories. My family life there was not awesome, but I do remember my 160-pound bull mastiff, Duke, scaring the daylights out of the mailman just for simply sitting in the yard. My parents had to get a P.O. box. That beautiful blind and one eye bull mastiff would regularly take a stroll down to the Donut Grove, all the way down Union Street, down the hill, and eat delicious greasy donuts. Something we would never dream about now in this day and age. But that was a time when dogs just were dogs. Beth Brody was 15 when she was murdered by
by 16-year-old Richard Baldwin with a baseball bat. She was born on October 10, 1977, murdered on November 18, 1992. Now, as we will discuss, she didn't really have much of a relationship with this boy. Teenage, I don't know, affection, we'll call it. It's very different than adult romantic love. Apparently, the 16-year-old boy, who had moved from Groveland to Peabody, Massachusetts, felt something that was not mutual with 15-year-old Beth. Beth Ann Brody. Let's talk about Beth. She was shy. She was smart. She was just starting to come out of her shell. She was very smart. Somebody like Beth could really have done anything, gone anywhere. I did have some correspondence back and forth with someone who knew Beth and spent time with Beth. Somebody who was her age, who had had a friendship with her since elementary school. I wanted to know what Beth liked. She liked some of the oldies. When I say oldies, like the 50s and 60s music of the time. And I remember, much like her friend shared, they would make up dance routines to the songs. They gave each other nicknames. Her friend shared that Beth loved animals, and she had a dog named Sudsy. Her friend thought maybe it was a bulldog or an American bulldog, which to me was very interesting since I have bulldogs who happen to be quiet right now, surprisingly. There's more to know about Beth, but unfortunately, 30 plus years later, after her murder, the only information you really find about her, aside from the Justice for Beth Brody website and social channels, thankfully they exist, is information about the boy who killed her at the time he was 16 years old. Richard Baldwin's trial began on March 28, 1994. Beth's family were forced to relive every detail about the violence and the brutality that Beth suffered that day. At the hands of someone who claimed to love her or at least like her, but it very clearly was an unhealthy obsession. And her family has said that that killer showed no remorse in the courtroom. And in the 30-plus years since his conviction for Beth's murder, he has continued to point the finger everywhere else except at himself. The verdict in the Beth Brody murder case came down on April 4, 1994. Guilty of first-degree murder. Life in prison with no chance of parole. April 4th, for those of us who were stuck in our own teen angst, was the day before Kurt Cobain took his own life. On April 4, 1994, The jury found Richard C. Baldwin guilty of murder in the first degree based on deliberate premeditation and extreme atrocity or cruelty. And due to changes in the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts, the ruling came down in 2014 that juveniles under the age of 18 could not be sentenced to life in prison. Now, I think outside looking in when you have no experience or connection with a family who has gone through what Beth Brody's family has gone through. That may seem like, oh yeah, give him a chance. But remember, guilty of murder in the first degree based on deliberate premeditation and extreme atrocity or cruelty. He set her up. He planned it. He had a baseball bat. He arranged with an unknowing mutual friend to get her to come to their house. He knew what he was going to do to her. In 2019, Beth's killer was up for parole and planned to attend the hearing, but canceled it at the last minute. Here we are in 2024, and Beth Brody's killer is looking to be paroled. This is an all-hands-on-deck situation. He offered no mercy to Beth. We need to signal boost. We need to send a message to the parole board that Beth Brody's killer should not be free. I have information from the Justice for Beth Brody call to action. Letter writing, sign holding, sharing and supporting, 
all everyday regular people advocates can do that. I talked to Sean, Beth's older brother. It's evident how painful this is for their family. We break down the case a bit and we talk about the impact and what their family is going through today. This is an update. Beth Brody, crime of a hometown kind, revisited Groveland, Massachusetts. I've been reading up a little bit about, you know, just to sort of refresh myself with the SJC ruling and, you know, trying to make sense of it. Yeah. How's that going? You know, I spent a lot of time a couple of weeks ago. I had no intention on spending this much time on this case, but there's the case of Daniel LaPlante. You're probably familiar with it. Yeah. Going back to like, oh shit, what year was it? 1988, I think. He was 17 when he killed a family. Mm Mm-hmm. Same thing, you know, he he wants to get out. There's no way that they're going to let him out because of how, I mean, let's hope. I right. can't see this kid getting getting out of prison because of the nature of his crimes. I mean, I think that kid in particular was on his way to being a serial killer. Mm-hmm. So, you know, what I think I found is that people that haven't experienced it don't know how to separate homicide from premeditated murder because i mean people die in in terrible ways all the time murder happens all the time as well but when the victim is just innocent in the whole thing and it's it's some sort of scheme or ploy that the the predator i like to call them baldwin lured beth from our family home you know that that doesn't happen by mistake and at some point the system needs to be able to separate those that can be rehabilitated and the ones that don't deserve to be rehabilitated. I mean, given the the bit of information I know about what led up to when Beth was killed, even some of the things that were reported to be said by him, diabolical. Right. If you or I did that, play by play of what happened that day, Mm -hmm. we'd never get out. Right. And why, why is that? that as an adult, it's pretty clear, but because they use this junk brain science argument that his brain wasn't fully developed and he didn't know what he was doing and so on and so forth, I just don't buy it. I I can't accept that as a a good reason. We see stories all the time about, you know, this 13 year old graduated from Harvard's moving on to medical school, you know, stuff like that. So the child prodigy counteracts any other argument that the brain sure may not be fully developed but using that science in such broad strokes would lead me to believe that all brains develop to the same level and we know that's not true and they develop at the same rate and we know that's also not true there's a lot to be said in a lot of these circumstances and again i don't mean to imply this is the case with this person this Mm -hmm. murderer I get that there are some extenuating circumstances that affect someone's behavior. We see it all the time, right? He may have had a very poor upbringing. He may have had some terrible experiences. We know that can affect someone's behavior. Mm -hmm. But you know what? I know a lot of people that have had really shitty upbringings and haven't done this. There's a whole lot of, yeah, we can say coping mechanisms and therapies and brain damage. And I know all that stuff goes into some of these considerations. But what happened that day and leading up to Beth's murder, it was incredibly cruel. Do you feel comfortable talking about some of those events of that day? Honestly, I don't know a whole lot about that day because there's such an age difference between the two of us. I had moved out of the house by then. I was living in Southern New Hampshire. I didn't know anything happened until about an hour after it happened. Wow. And <laughs> we're kind of dating the case here, but my sister Dawn left a message on my answering machine because we didn't carry cell phones back then. So when I got home from work, there was a message that he had hit her and that I needed to come home. And the first thing that popped into my mind is, good God, she just got braces and she's going to be pissed. And I had no idea of just how bad it was. 
and uh, we stopped, my wife and I, we stopped at the police station on the way in. I figured, you know, here I am, the big brother, I'm going to take care of this. And we stopped there, and a good friend of the family was an officer, and he saw me in the lobby, and with the strangest look on his face, he said, you just need to go home. And that's mm-hmm. when I knew I, it, the whole thing had changed. Did you know anything about this person? I mean, a lot of the the media reports back then in 1992 when Beth was killed suggested all of those typical newspaper headlines, cheerleader killed, you know, all of those sensationalizations that we see, unfortunately, that still ring true today. My understanding, because Sean, you and I have spoken about this before, and we're revisiting this case. I, this This case never leaves me, by the way. I always think about Beth and your family quite a lot. Thank you. Being, you know, two Groveland kids and she and I didn't know each other, but, you know, we went to some of the same schools before, you know, I moved away before I I reached high school, but we walked some of the same halls, you know. What was their relationship that your family is aware of? They dated once. I mean, and dating for a 15-year-old is like maybe going out to a party together? I mean, that's not dating. What do you know about what best relationship was with this person? From what I understand, and obviously I wasn't filled into all the finite details of it, yeah. but there really weren't any as far as I know. Mm-hmm. And like you hinted at it, at that age, two people that want to be boyfriend and girlfriend, they kind of sit together at the same lunch table. Maybe they'll hold hands when they walk back and forth to the bus. That, to me, as far as I know, was about it. I don't think there was anything out of town or out of the neighborhood or anything like that that ever took place. She had, for whatever reason, this sense that she didn't want it to be any more than that. She had better sense, I guess. She was young, and she wasn't really interested in that at that phase in her life, I'm sure. No, absolutely not. I mean, she was very, very shy. She was fine with people that she knew. But I think there was a little bit of a, uh, a slowdown when she got to middle school because all of a sudden there's this whole new group of friends. And um, she was more of a bookworm. She's probably the smartest person in our family. She had great grades. She was very well liked by her, her, the friends that she had. And boy, I'm really finding out she had some really great friends. She started to come out of her shell as a young woman she spent a lot of time with my other sister, Dawn, and they did some cheering together. And she was really becoming her own person rather than just, you know, the, a bookworm school student. And it was nice, you know, to see this bright smile on her face. A lot of the things that come to mind are we threw a surprise birthday party for my mom. And there's some still, still some pictures floating around from that night. And she had this giant wide smile, probably the biggest smile I've ever seen on her face. The year that she died was the same year that I got married. So we have some wedding photos. You know, it was just, she was just beginning. As yeah, just getting started. To, just right. to trying to figure out who she was going to be. Right. And this person just couldn't seem to let go of something that really didn't exist. I think a lot of young boys at that age probably feel like, you know, this is the relationship I want to have, and this is my girl. And she just didn't see it that way, and he couldn't accept that. Do you know the period of time from when they were friendly and and she stepped away from whatever the notion of this relationship was until she was killed? I know she was killed in November of 1992. Was it a period of time of, like, the summer to November? I think it was something that started... Uh, when school started up that year, so September. So a a really short period of time for anybody to gain some feelings, but she knew enough to stay away. And then on that day, he used a a mutual friend to to get her to his home. And I think that uh, she had trust in him, but not in Baldwin. Because that was sort of a buffer for, for probably both of them at that time, right? The house was in the neighborhood. Yeah, it was. It was, uh, you know, naturally, it was a home they went to after school. There was no adults around at the time. So they had a couple hours to just hang out and do teenager stuff. Beth was home after school. I, I'm assuming schoolwork, homework, something like that. 
because it, it was around dinner time when it happened. What was the relationship with the neighbor? He had always been around. Not a bad kid. Uh, I met him a couple of times, probably just in passing. Really couldn't make any judgment on him until after, obviously. You know, I, I think my emotions may be misplaced with him because he kind of facilitated it and allowed it to happen. Whether or not he would have been able to stop it, I don't know. At the time, he's the only person I could blame. I wonder, given you know, the neighbor's age where this took place, if they were even aware that this was, they couldn't have been aware that this was the plan with this kid. I don't believe he would have allowed it to happen had he known. The stories that were told in court was he was, he just had to go get her, you know, go to the house and get her because he wanted to talk one last time. It moved very quickly. Beth was attacked. She did not survive. The person who attacked her was found later the same night at Pentucket, right? Correct. At the school nearby, which is very close to where Beth was living at the time. Less than a mile. He had made some attempt at harming himself, went to the hospital. Hale at the time. Hale isn't there anymore. No. When we spoke before, you told me about a couple of comments that he had made in the hospital that were pretty twisted too. Do you remember those? The one that hangs heavy in my head is when he raised the bat towards her, he said, and I wanted to be a baseball star. Oh my God. The key word to catch there is wanted. So he clearly knew that now he wasn't going to be. He had to know that the behavior The planning and then following through with that plan and ultimately that behavior was going to cancel out anything that he may have wanted to do in the future. You would think, but, you know, here we are and he's Mm -hmm. somehow Mm -hmm. looking for some sort of forgiveness. So in 2019, he was technically able to go up for parole. And there was a reversal there. Do you feel largely because of the pressure the family was putting on him? I do. He first requested, because he's been eligible since 2014, five years passed, but there was, he'd done no preparation for it at that point. He hadn't taken any program. He spent a lot of time in solitary confinement. Um, And then he postponed. So we were kind of relieved. We didn't know if it was a, forever postponement or just a, you know, maybe I'm not quite ready today. And then a couple of weeks goes by and he's ready again. So now we have to go through all of this for a second time within a, a very short period of time. And then closer to a month before, maybe a, a week or so before the hearing is when he canceled altogether. You're emotionally trying to prepare yourselves, your entire family for what you're about to face. And that's a re-victimization by itself. Oh, yeah. And then he decides, because this is the only control that this person has over anything, then he decides for whatever reason, doesn't really matter what the reasons are, right? Hopefully, it's the pressure that he has felt coming from the family and all of the advocates for your, for the Brodies, your family. Five years goes by. Here we are in twenty. 20- 24, 10 years after he is technically eligible to go up for parole. Right. He is now in his 40s. Right. He's been in prison since 1994. Is that when the verdict came down? Ironically, on my anniversary, he was sentenced. Oh, my goodness. That's sort of a gift. Right. An unwanted gift. Right. Given the events that led up to that. 1994. He's sentenced to life in prison because he murdered Beth Brody, 15-year-old girl, premeditated, got the neighbor, a friend, a mutual friend, for her to come over, hit her. She doesn't survive the, the night. Now, he is up for another shot at parole. What does that entail that you're aware of for 
an inmate to go up for parole? Well, it, it could be very little mm. because um, attorneys are hired and paid for by the state. Mm -hmm. Any expert testimony uh, paid for by the state, the attorney gets paid win or lose. So it's almost like a fishing expedition. If you're a, a defense attorney, you say, hey, you know, I, I can go latch on to one of these guys and drag him in front of the parole board. Win or lose, I still get a paycheck. Right. Right. Um, with no forethought of what that does to the other side of the story. Because let me explain to you the, the parole office, because a lot of people have um, the wrong idea of what the parole board looks like. Mm -hmm. um, everybody pictures this big, long bench with a whole bunch of judge type people standing there and in this giant courtroom, or, or even like the courtroom in Haverhill is five times the size of this room that we're going to be sitting in. It is smaller than a classroom you would have had in high school. There's enough room for probably 20 supporters on each side. And the distance between my family side of that room and the chair that he will be sitting in with his back to us is about three steps. So it's mm -hmm. intimate to say the least. And I've been to three of these other parole hearings now for other people that are in the same position we are. And they were juvenile murderers, most of whom were not ready, one of whom has been released since on his second attempt. It's just painful to see these families get put through it all again, and now knowing that my family has to go do it. What are some of the steps that we as supporters can do? I know that there's been information shared on the Justice for Beth pages, which I will continue to share. What are some of the action items that those of us who want to support the family can do? Can we write letters? Can we come and, you know, stand out by the parole board location with signs? Like, what are some of the things that would best help your family in this? See, that's a tough call because yeah. um, the letter writing campaign, I think, is probably our, our best way. Honestly, I think there's going to be hundreds upon hundreds of those letters. They go to the board as a whole. They don't go to individual board members. But um, we'd been told before that they are obligated to at least consider those letters. I don't think they're going to read them all. They probably mm -hmm. won't have time. I'd rather have mm -hmm. them spending time on the case mm -hmm. than on the letters. But I think the sheer volume of those letters is, is going to make an impact. And I think doing other things like this conversation with you and some other news organizations have reached out and we've yet to, to finalize any of those plans. But as we get closer, I think the story will get louder and I think a lot more people are going to hear about it. And I think just making a buzz on the street that there's people here in opposition. I feel awful for the families that go to parole hearings and they don't have the representation inside that room. So I would have to assume the board at that point says, Jesus, not a lot of people here that oppose this parole. And I think we're going to have just the opposite effect. And like you said, if we had people standing outside, whether they had signs or not, I think it's just a, a show of support. It's a very small area. And I think it, it wouldn't take a whole lot of people to make it look crowded. At the same time, I don't want it to be a circus. But I think it's, it's a good thing to get out there digitally like we're doing. The social media platforms, uh, they gain a lot of traction. And obviously the, the fan base that you have and, and sharing the story is pretty crazy. And, you know, people really do care about these things. I have learned throughout my, I'll call it my short-lived career is, is doing, you know, things in the crime realm like this. People really do legitimately care about these situations. They legitimately do care about what the families are dealing with. And they will show their support, whether it means them coming out physically and holding a sign whether it's sharing something on, you know, their social feeds or writing a letter to say, we stand committed to this message with the family. I think that it's all of those things. And 
we'll make sure we get that word out to folks. Whether they ever knew Beth or knew anything about your family at all, people do want to contribute in a positive way. I believe that wholeheartedly. The pressure is that much greater with just regular everyday citizens, advocates, and people who are part of the media organization, that brings a little bit more pressure. Without it, it's just another piece of paper. It's another case on a desk without that, the human touch, I guess you could say. What, if anything, is your family able to learn about the status of the inmate? Do you get any sort of information through your own advocate about what the status is of this person, whether they have family support, what they could be telling the parole board ahead of this? I don't know how any of that works. It's upon request. Mm. So they don't give you a continuous update or anything like that. But as long as you're Corey certified, which everybody in the family is, you can request that information. That's a tough call to make. How many times do you want to check in? Because honestly, we don't care how he's doing. If he's misbehaving or something like that, I guess that would be okay to find out. I'm just curious as to whether he's going through the motions of getting out. Does he have anywhere to get out to? Like, does he have any family support? Does he have anywhere to go? If this kid gets out, well, he's a man now, but What's the likelihood that they would even consider it? Does he have any kind of support whatsoever? There must be somebody there that would act as a sponsor. He needs a place to go. I suspect that's probably he has a sister that's a couple of years younger than he is. Um, I think both of his parents have passed, so I don't think that's an option. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. He he. But he definitely needs to. Uh, he has to do a couple of things before he can even be considered. One of them is accept responsibility for what he's done, hmm. and secondly, um, is have a plan in place. Hmm. So what happens after this? You, your family, and your supporters and your advocates go to this hearing in um sorry it's happening on may 16th is that correct correct you all convene does he speak and his representatives really so you have to sit and listen to this person speak about the last number of decades he can ramble on about whatever the hell he wants for, and wow. he, it's it's unlimited he has as mm-hmm. much time as he needs the victims however we have the opportunity for five people to testify for five minutes each mm-hmm. and that's it and whether we want to use one of those five slots for a district attorney or or somebody else i'm pretty sure my stepfather is going to speak i'd be very surprised if my mom did I do think, however, the two girls will speak. Mm-hmm. I will definitely speak. And we have our eye on a couple of other people. If mom doesn't speak and there's one open slot, there's a few people in mind. But it's going to be critical that uh, the message we get across is Beth, because they know the case and they know the law and they can read up on his incarceration. What they don't know is the person that's not there. That's right. So it's up to us to uh, to bring that along. Let them know what we're missing and potentially what they're missing. I mean, you are her voice now. Yeah. And um, making those statements, uh, or preparing those statements is painful. Mm-hmm. You run the gamut of grief and anger to I just want justice or vengeance. Yeah. And you can't, you know, I may think about it in all those ways some days and other people treat it differently. I don't think that we can rely on the system to take care of this for us because the system told us before that we wouldn't have to worry about it. And now we have to go through it every five years. So Mm -hmm. even when that day is over, the panel does not decide that day. It's not like we get a guilty or a not guilty verdict, like in a court case or anything you may see on TV. 
they get months if they need to, to mm. review the case. So again, we sit in limbo with this, the, the hammer hanging over our head to find out what happens. And even if he's denied, he gets another five years and he can come back at it. It could be as little as three years if he's already enrolled in some programming, but most times it's five. And where is he housed? He's in Old Colony Correctional at the moment. He was in Sousa Baranowski, mm -hmm. um, which is maximum security for the, the worst of the worst. So it was very suitable. He spends a lot of time in Bridgewater because of he's, you know, he has mental health issues. I asked the point of questions about him, not because I think it's important to know, just that it's important to sort of clarify how it works, because I really don't know. And, you know, I'm learning about these things and I become more equipped with information as, as I, you know, become more, I don't know, invested in these sorts of cases. Right. So think of the people that don't have an investment like you do and, you know, people just leading their everyday lives and stories like this, you know, it goes across a ticker on a news screen somewhere or it yeah. passes past on their news feed on their phone or, and it just disappears. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't last um, so it doesn't mean a lot to a lot of people, but it means a lot to the people that care. You know, you get the same, oh, that's too bad. And then it's, they're on to the next thing. Worse than that is it, so many people and you can't really be mad at them, but they say, mm -hmm. I know how you feel. Mm -hmm. And honestly, there are very few people that do know how we feel. In Massachusetts, when they changed this law, there was 63 people that knew how we felt. They moved the age up to 25 now. So there's another group, I think another 80. You know, people's hearts are in the right place. And a lot of times they scramble for that comment. They don't know what to say. But that's a tough one to take, uh, you know, that you know how we feel. You're part of a club that no one wants to be in. Right. You didn't ask for this. You don't deserve this. Your family has been thrown into something that no one is equipped for, even all these many years later, how can you possibly be equipped or prepared for the things that you're going to be forced into facing? I will continue to talk about this. I will be sure to share information and send my own letter. You get um, the link right off the site. I think you already shared it once, right? I did, and I will continue yeah. to. Absolutely. If there are any events, whether it's something that's in Groveland to rally people just in Beth's memory, I will do everything in my power to be there. If it comes down to me, you know, being in the room to support the family on the 16th. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. I'd like that. I would very much like to just be there just to have my presence as a support. But it's outrageous that we're talking about this so many years later. She's gone. All of the things, all of her wishes weren't able to come true. What was Beth going to be? You know, she was smart. She was headed to college. She could have been a doctor, a scientist. She could have found the cure to something. You know, we don't know. We don't know because she wasn't able to do that. And for a long time, all we had was positive, good memories of Beth and you know, now every time this comes up, of course, the memories come rushing back, but it forces us to think about him more than her, which is not what any of us wanted. And unfortunately, that is so often the case with victims of crime and their families. So often when you search someone, what often comes up is right. the information about the person who committed the crime. So much less of the information is being able to talk about that person and who they were and what they wanted. And that's why it's important for me. I definitely want to have a family member involved in my conversations. I definitely want to make sure that the family who knows firsthand what's happening can share that with the public. I mean, that's the most important, most impactful information that can be put out into the, the stratosphere. You've been an incredible representative for the family and I know how taxing that's got to be for you and you know your family and I know that you know your mom's had to face this unbelievable happening 
with her little girl. It puts us all in this on edge atmosphere. We were all in a group chat the other day when we were talking about putting stuff together and, and getting organized, you know, strategizing. It kind of blows up, puts this unnecessary pressure on each other. The way one person wants to, to grieve or to tackle this isn't necessarily the way somebody else wants to do it. So we have to right. find a way that it works for all of us. The last thing we need is to be pissed off at each other over something. You need each other for support. Right. Right. Most, most definitely. Your family needs each other for support. And um, the last thing anybody wants is for this person, this inmate, I will call him, continuing to affect your family's life and your futures together because right. of his bad actions. I know it's easier said than done. It's so right. easy to say when you're not in it. And I get that. Anything you need, you let me know. I will get the message out. I will continue to get the message out however I can. I have developed some relationships with some really great folks who advocate in this space. And I will share this information with them and ask them, can you give us a signal boost on this? If they would like to put something together like what you and I have done, I'm open to that too. Sure. Um, as many audiences as we can get to. Is, Absolutely. Is what I'm hoping for. That's what I'm hoping for, too. Well, I thank you for your time. I want you to go and do something fun. Walk your puppy dog. Okay. Take care. Will do. Thank you, Sean. Thank you to Beth Brody's family and friends. Visit Justice for Beth Brody. Brody is B-R-O-D-I-E. All of this information I have posted at Crime of the Truest Kind on the episode link and in the show notes of the podcast. The parole hearing for Beth Brody's murderer is Thursday, May 16th. We have one month to mobilize and support the Brody family. As Sean said, there are many other families just in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts who are experiencing the same thing. And I stand by it. People do care. It is important and it is impactful to get this information out to as many people as possible. Thank you for listening. My name is Angel Wood. This is Crime of the Truest Kind. New England crime stories and a little history thrown into. You can find the show everywhere. Listen on Good Pods. Good Pods is an independent podcasting platform who lately has been showing Crime of the Truest Kind a lot of extra love. Follow the show at Crime of the Truest Kind on all the places. Give the show five stars on Apple Podcasts. Share a great review. Send show ideas via email crimeofthetruestkind at gmail.com. You can support the show. Four tiers on Patreon starting at just $1.00. I dropped the May monthly mini on Patreon, albeit a little late. I'm deep into this festival thing. And trying not to miss any shows, by the way. Trying not to skip. Thank you to our superstars, executive producers Lisa McColgan, Rhiannon. Thank you, Val. Thank you, Devin. Pam K. Thank you to all you wicked cool people. Most definitely, I would love the show to be self-sustaining. We're not there yet but I appreciate all of you. There will be more live shows. I'm trying to sort if I have time to fit them in before everyone sort of disappears for the summer. I'll give a TBD on that one. In the meantime, please help us signal boost justice for Beth Brody. Whether it be you send a letter to the parole board in support of keeping her killer behind bars, whether it be you're sharing things on your social media feeds to make more people aware of the situation or perhaps be there in person. That is information that I need to get from the family, what that might look like. If it's a matter of having an army of supporters outside, that is definitely something we will be talking about. Thank you for listening. 
and never, ever, ever forget to lock your goddamn doors. 